I guess I have the dubious honor of being here, the person keeping you all from the bar. So <laughs> here we are. Um, I want to talk about the future. I want to talk about the future of nuclear energy specifically, consolidating a lot of information that you've heard over the last couple of days. But I want to present what I think is an interesting opportunity going forward of something we can start doing now. We talk about futures, but you have to put a stake in the ground at some point. And so I want to take it kind of one small step at a time, but I want to be able to look at exactly where, where we're going to go forward. Now, here's where we've been. You have, starting with windmills a long time ago, and now we have nuclear power. We have power that is reliable, clean, baseload power that we can rely on. But the green folks want to start playing Don Quixote all over again, tilting at windmills. And so they just go backward, but they don't get anything that can actually work. And we're going to show you why. The, um, the point being that I want to uh, talk about thinking small. This is the small modular reactor designs that are being looked at today, and it will give you an idea of where the future can go. This is a slide I had last year. Same old song. You have nuclear power, you want world peace, you don't want reactors, it's ticking time bombs. But ticking time bombs are exactly what you get when you don't have electricity. So what do you end up with? A different tune. Now my German isn't all that great, but I think it's stop the price explosion for peace, uh, freedom, and prosperity. And this was done in Germany just recently, and we've gone over, Wolfgang gave you an excellent uh, uh, view of what that was. And it's something that we want to um, uh, to deflect from, from the standpoint that uh, when Germany closed down, they did open their reactors up. But as I just heard, they're only opening up until April. So it's not a permanent solution. And now they're having to go back to coal and nat natural gas. So what we want to do <clears throat> is we want to take a fresh look at nuclear where we can have a realistic e expectation of what we can have going forward. So let's think small, let's think fast, and let's think better. Now I want to make the case for nu nuclear specifically. <clears throat> First thing is, where is the nuclear industry today? What's going on around the world? Secondly, I want to go into nuclear itself as compared to the other so sources. Now I'll be taking a lot of data from what Marty just told you about wind and solar, but I'm going to tailor it and specifically dovetail it into the argument for nu nuclear. And then where do we go from here? And I have a proposal that I want to present to you, get your thoughts on it and input, but see where we can positively go in, into the future. Now, first country, and these are the guys that uh, have been doing the most in the last few years, and that's China. There we go. They want to dominate the nuclear in, in industry. They have been going after uh, light water reactors, thorium fueled reactors, high temperature gas reactors. In fact, they have the first commercial fast breeder helium cooled pebble bed reactor that is, uh, is in actual commercial use and operation. They also want to be self-sufficient. They want to provide all the fuel and components themselves. 
Second big player in this is France. 70% of their power comes from electricity, from nuclear, and they're the largest exporter to the rest of Europe. They've been bailing them out over the last year or two since the Ukraine war. And an interesting thing is that 17% of their power comes from recycled fuel. I'll be talking about that later. And they're now planning 14 new reactors over and above the 56 reactors they currently have in operation. The next one is Russia, 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 Russia. They uh, have been manufacturing their own reactors for a long time, even since uh, Chernobyl. But they're also an exporter and have been very, uh, Rosatom has been very dynamic in terms of marketing their nuclear technology. They also supply, or a major supplier of fuel and components to the rest of the world. And this has created a real bottleneck because they've been cut off because of the san sanctions. They also have interesting small modular reactors that they've developed into floating power stations that they put into the Arctic cities to use for winter power. And they also have made two icebreakers that are gonna make three more. But they have no interest in wind and solar. The next one, I'll go through several of these that are going around the world. I'll do this as quickly as I can. South Korea, 27% of their power, 33% uh, by, by 2030, and they are a major exporter of nuclear components as well. But they have 25 reactors and have three pending. The next is the UK, 15% of their power out output comes from the nine reactors they have currently running. They have uh, canceled 33 already, but they're now looking at going into the small modular reactor arena with Rolls-Royce building 10 by 2035. The next is India. India has 22 reactors, they're relatively small, but uh, they plan on adding eight more by 2032. And they're pushing thorium because they have not had access to uranium because they were not a signer of the non-proliferation treaty. Now, next one is Ger Germany that we've already talked about. They do have the three reactors left open, but that's very short-lived. The wind and solar died, as you know, and now it's back to coal and gas. The last is Japan which, of course, had Fukushima. They have 33 reactors right now. They have two more pending to open, and they have shuttered uh, 27, but they're planning on bringing those back online because they want to get back into nuclear in a big way uh, because they need to get their energy sources more off of fossil and uh, without wind and solar that they can depend on. They're now at 6%, they're going to 30%. And the last but not least is the US, which is still the big dog in the room. They have 93 reactors, but they only have two pending down at the Vogel site in Georgia. And these two have been, uh, it's taken 14 years to build them and $25 billion. Those are the only two in the last 30 years. So what has happened in the US? There has been a focus more supporting the aging reactor fleet. And this is quite important because the reactor fleet that they have uh, is something that provides 20% of our power. And they, they are aging and they have to be able to take, take care of them. The other important point is that they've had the opportunity where we were energy in independent and market do dominant, but they don't seem, uh, they're dismissing that. And that's terribly un unfortunate. The next is the Department of Energy has several demonstration programs for small modular reactors, so there is some activity, but it is limited. And it's limited because of the fact that DOE has been, uh, they've been just holding their, 
cards to their chest and not wanting to move forward. The NRC has had a problem. And the, um, the real issue is they, uh, well, nuclear is still not favored. And so that's a problem going forward. There are four reactor programs that have been used. One is with new scale with a light water reactor similar to the military reactors. The second one is uh, from Terra Power, and that's owned by Bill Gates. And that's a fast reactor, a fast breeder reactor that is sodium cooled and has molten salt storage. The third is from X Energy. That's a high temperature gas reactor, helium cooled with pebble bed fuel, very similar to the one that's operating, <clears throat> excuse me, in China. And the fourth is from GE that has got uh, a couple of programs going with a 300 megawatt uh, smaller version of a boiling water reactor. They have one going into Clinch River, the other going into North Carolina. The problem, though, is funding. That's always been the problem. We have $6 billion uh, from 2021 funding that's being used to prop up ailing reactors, uh, which Diablo Canyon in California is one of them. And Diablo Canyon is uh, now going to be remaining open because California just went to wind and solar and it hasn't worked. So they're bailing them out. The second one is with the in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. That's $34 billion, but it's all in production tax credits, and that's to keep the older reactors going and more economically viable. But that pales in significance to the $350 billion that's going to wind and solar. So you can see how upside down things are and what uh, the priorities of the administration are. This fragmented effort has no cohesion to it. It's not a forward-thinking energy policy, and they're just sitting on their hands, certainly not like other, other countries. Point is, why the hesitancy? I want to talk briefly about fear-mongering. That's still the ne nemesis for nuclear. There are unwarranted fears over radiation and waste. There have been no radiation deaths or injuries in America, certainly, for 70 years. Uh, except Chernobyl, there hasn't been any around the world, including Fukushima. 18,000 plus years of safe operation in 32 countries. Waste is very well secured in cooling ponds and dry casks. But the point we're dealing with here is psychological. Is Fear is what you don't know and you can't see. I think Alex talked a little bit about this last night. Perception becomes reality. So they ignore the history, they ignore the data, they ignore the science. And so what you get is they pick on the invisible boogeymen. Radiation, what you can't see, so you can amp the fear up on it. And it's the same as CO2 has been done for fossil fuels. So this gets amped up by the government, by the green advocates, and certainly by the media, and this becomes a problem going forward. But it's totally un unwarranted. Now, why nuclear? Big point here is one word, it's scale. Nuclear can scale up or scale down like no other form of energy that we have. I'm going to talk about four or five aspects of it. The first being power den density, followed by footprint, which are tied together. The next is availability. Fourth one is lifespan. And the fifth one is waste. Let's get started. One uranium pellet is equivalent to 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas, 120 gallons of oil, or one ton of coal. Now, one fuel rod has 333 pellets in it. One reactor is 45,000 fuel rods. That's 15 million pellets. That's equivalent to 15 million tons of coal. Now, the big thing here is that the reason I bring this up is that it was an equivalent footprint issue where a 
coal plant or a natural gas plant. It's about the same size as a nuclear plant. But where this blows up is when we get to the footprint when you talk wind and solar. And here it goes off the charts. You have 430 acres on a facility in England called Hinkley Point, and that's equivalent to 130,000 acres of solar panels and 250,000 acres of wind farm. Now, uh, 130,000 acres is roughly 200 square miles. That's about 10 times the size of Manhattan. And 250,000 acres, although the wind farms vary considerably between about uh, 300 square miles going up to about 600 square miles. And one of the uh, e examples was Indian Point, which was a reactor they just closed down outside of New York City, where it's 240 acres and it would take 500 square miles of wind turbines to replace it. What they did do, they went to nat natural gas to fed three other plants. From a number point of view, we're talking about over three million of solar panels to make up that one, one reactor and 431 wind, windmills. So it's out of sight. The next aspect I want to mention is availability. Now this chart is actually from 2016, but if you notice the yellow curve shows nuclear at 9% capacity, and you have wind and solar in the green uh, at 17. But when you look at, that's the nameplate capacity, when you look at the delivered power of actually what's being used, 20% is nu nuclear. And that has to do with the capacity factor of being available and being baseline power that's there 24 seven. Wind and solar, as you heard uh, from Greg's talk about what happened in the Texas freezes, that dropped that usage to 9%. So this is something where nuclear has that staying power. The next thing I want to talk about is lifespan. Nuclear uh, reactors are designed for normally 60 years of operation and they've extended some up to 80 years. That's 24 seven deliverable power and they only refuel it once every 18 to 30 months. They pull out one third of the fuel rods to, to replace them and they recycle them uh, reg regularly. The base load power, of course, works in good weather and bad day and night. Wind and solar, however, they've had an expected life of 25 to 30 years but in reality, because of early replacements and because of other problems with failing windmill blades, they've been averaging about 10 to 15 years. Some have been able to get up to 20, but it's roughly half of what was expected. This is gonna have consequences in a minute. So the intermittency based on weather patterns and day daylight is what makes the big difference intermittency versus reliability. Now let's talk waste. Nuclear waste problems have been way overblown because the spent fuel has been safely stored for over 60 years without any problems. The first five years they're secured in cooling ponds and then they're moved to dry cask storage for up to 50 years. And all the waste is stored at existing reactor sites so you have them secured they're all, all protected. Right now, there are about 91,000 metric tons of total waste that's accumulated over 70 years in these ponds and the dry cask. And they're increasing about 2,000 metric tons a year. That would fit into a football field about 40 feet high, the total waste. Now, there is a problem because they don't have a long-term storage solution, but I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And it's nothing compared to the waste you're gonna see with wind and solar because that's the thing they have not been talking about. The lifespans, because they're cut almost in half of what they expected, the waste problems are just starting to come online. Wind turbines themselves are not recy recyclable. 
You saw this before in other slides and other, other pre presentations just earlier. It would take, because they are not recyclable, they have to cut them up and put them into landfills, as you can see here. They expect in the next 20 years, 720,000 metric tons, 43 million metric tons by 2050. It's just unconscionable the way they think they can sweep this under the carpet, so to speak. The looming solar waste, though, is the one that's a real problem because it's a hazmat material. You're using lead and cad cadmium, and that becomes a huge pr problem, particularly where they ship them off to Af Africa into landfills. It's 10 to 30 times the cost of a uh, uh, of recycling versus putting it into landfill. It's cheaper to actually build new panels than to recycle. So the Chinese price gouging and the fact they have low quality is a key factor in this. 315,000 metric tons in four years will be a problem and they expect 78 million metric tons by 2050. Now, big thing, and it was commented earlier, but I want to repeat it, is that the toxic waste in these solar panels are, for an equivalent unit of energy is 300 times more than nuclear waste. The EU mandates recycling, the US doesn't. Nor does the levelized cost of energy actually uh, take into this waste disposal issue. One thing I wanted to put in here, uh, my wife wanted me to put the, put the picture in the middle in here because it wins the wimpiest windmill award of the year <laughs> for what it looks like. But the environmental waste is a real, real issue. Uh, they're waived from the, uh, uh, both the endangerment finding and of course they're waived from the Endangered S Species Act. And one thing I just want to point out, I feel I'm a conservationist got morphed into being an environmentalist. Then we got morphed into being a destructionist. And I think that's the problem. And so the problem we have is that uh, nuclear doesn't have any of this, and this is a problem that is ongoing that's being swept under the carpet. Bottom line is this, nuclear energy is the answer most concentrated power source with the least footprint, the most reliable, deliverable baseload power, up to six times the lifespan of wind and solar, least waste, controlled and protected with the best safety record, and it's environmentally friendly. SMRs can advance, the small modular re reactors can advance the state of the art to make this even better, and reduce size, resources, cost, waste, build time and in infrastructure. The decentralization of the grid is a real important issue that the, S the SMRs can, uh, can bring to the table. And it's less vulnerable to attacks. You can put it under, underground. And you can have increased high performance, high temperature uh, operation for process heat and desalinization. So where do we go from here? The U.S. is blindly tied to green renewable energy. Beyond fossil fuels, nuclear is the only baseload power. We need to kickstart with a next generation reactor. So it's time for a new approach. And the new approach that I'm taking is this. I want to develop a small modular reactor that uses spent fuel because it can help solve both the fuel problem, the waste problem, and develop the next generation te technology. Turns out that spent fuel only uses 4% of the fissile energy that's stored in these fuel rods, all 91,000 metric tons. That can be repurposed to power an advanced reactor. Spent fuel could power the US for 200 years, has enough stored energy, latent waiting to be used. You can co-locate the reactors to start with at existing sites where you already have the spent fuel. 
You don't have to transport it. And you also have the transmission assets and the security and the trained staff in order to, to operate it with a minimal need for additional uranium ore. So the proposed small modular reactor, or what I'll call the spent fuel reactor, would have the following characteristics. It'd be an advanced SMR tailored to waste incineration. Be a fast convert and burn high temperature reactor, non-water cooled because of the high temperature and high operating temperatures required. So it'd be helium, liquid sodium, or molten salt cooled with passive self-cooling built in and load following capability as well. Important thing, and I talked about this in detail la last year, is having ceramic fuel rods that would be required both to work with the spent fuel and to enable the high temperature op operation. And then the last piece of the puzzle is to develop the fuel recycling pro process to repurpose the spent fuel. Reason why the cladding material is critical here, and this was the first step that is now being, being tested and moved into manufacturing and full testing, in fact, the Volga reactor next year, is that the, uh, what the, they use silicon carbide, that it has a operating temperature up to 2,000 degrees C. So you don't have any safety problems where the metal cladding that has been used uh, only goes up to about 700 degrees C. It can oxidize. Oxidize creates hydrogen if you have a, a superheated steam environment, and I give you Fukushima. So the last and most important piece is the funding. Here, it turns out there is, from Yucca Mountain, a nuclear waste fund that was set up to basically uh, support Yucca Mountain. But when it was canceled, the money was just put into the treasury, gaining 1.5 billion interest a month. It's $44 billion. It's dormant, and the funds were actually sourced by rate, rate payers. So what we're looking at doing is trying to get Congress to get that money available. It's off budget, and it would allow you to uh, use it for incinerating waste along with using storage. But right now the law says only storage, and so that's the problem. We're getting some traction in Congress right now. In fact, I talked to Senator jo Johnson about it earlier. And we are making some progress. The GAO report had tackled this issue. They wanted to have it put back into the general fund. Taxpayers already spend $9 billion a year supporting fuel storage. It'll be $30 billion by 2030. So they need congressional action to break the impasse on the waste. And they need to develop then a permanent solution. Why not using spent fuel to do that? I'd like to finish by saying with my colleagues here, who are the guys who put the men on the moon, we need another moonshot. We did it with $4 billion in less than 10 years. Of course, that $4 billion 10 is, I think, worth about 120 now, and the way the Biden's going, it'd be through the roof. But we would build a full-scale spent fuel reactor prototype in a similar multi-year program with government and industry partnership funded with the waste fund to start with. You streamline the NRC uh, reg regulations you could literally do it in seven to nine years for less than $5 billion. So there's no time to waste the waste. So as Neil Armstrong said, I'll paraphrase him, that would be one small step for nuclear power and one giant leap for energy security. And as our German friend said in protest and for peace, freedom, and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. Thank you.